Okay, so the last thing that we're going to talk about with ancient Greece is the Hellenistic period. So let's get into it. Okay. Um, so um, this is the Temple of Apollo, and it was um, designed and, and created by uh, Paeonios of Ephesus and Aphnis of Melitos. Okay, and it was a very interesting structure. So one of the things that you can see just looking at the floor plan is that it's fairly elaborate. It has a double colonnade all the right way around the stylobate. We also have a lot um, of extra columns on the porch entering in through the east entrance of the temple. Um, Apollo's the sun god, so this would be facing east where the sun rises, right? Um, and the image you see below is just what is left of this, but we can tell from the ruins what the floor plan looked like. There are a couple different things. Uh, this particular structure was worked on off and on for about 500 years, so it was changed stylistically uh, several times and kind of adapted throughout the time. One of the particularly interesting features of this temple that is kind of a, a Hellenistic thing is that it's what we call hypothral, which means um, open, it's open at the top, it's an open air temple, so it didn't have a roof, it was open to the sky. Uh, you can see that word in your, on canvas in your vocabulary. Also there was no pediment, so the pediment remembers the triangular part on the facade of the temple, there's no pediment, um, and there really isn't um, a defined cella or naos, which is like the interior enclosed space. So it's just columns all the way around um, a, a, on a stylobate uh, in, encompassing a, a courtyard-like structure inside, basically. Okay, so this is kind of uh, one of the, the changes we see in some temples of this time. This was of the Ionic order, so it's still in one of our classical orders, but it's changing the structural rules of how uh, temples are laid out. Okay, another thing um, that we see at this time coming through is this idea of um, kind of city planning, kind of structured city planning and this intentional kind of design where we have these grid-like uh, cities where in the center they have a stoas, a, a marketplace around a forum, Often there's a temple and a theater in, in the center of the city as well, and everything kind of radiates out from that and is very intentionally planned and laid out. So all the domos are sort of standardized, the houses are sort of standardized and laid out kind of like a grid. So this is another thing that we see in the Hellenistic period where things are more um, intentionally laid out like this. Another uh, different kind of structure that comes about during this time period are um, monuments. So these, these things that aren't exactly buildings, but they aren't exactly sculptures. They're somewhere kind of in between, sort of standalone monuments. And one example of that are these kind of um, altars. They're not exactly altars like an altar outside of a temple like we've seen before. They're again, kind of these standalone monumental sort of structures. This particular one is the altar of Zeus. And um, in this, we have lots of uh, friezes. We have ionic columns all the way through, but again, because it's not a temple, it doesn't follow the exact ionic order, as you can see. And it's kind of a strange um, structure. Uh, we have relief uh, sculpture all the way around. And this is showing um, Zeus and the gods battling against the giants. So this is the giant Omaki, which we also saw uh, depicted on the Parthenon at the Acropolis, right? So this is a theme that's depicted pretty often. Since Zeus is the king of the gods, he leads them into battle against the giants. So it makes sense since this is an altar to Ju Zeus that this would be one of the topics uh, depicted in the sculpture. So here uh, in the upper left, we have Athena. Um, when she's grabbing a giant's hair, she has her shield on her arm. She's getting ready to attack. We see a lot of emotional depiction in these works. So a lot more um, expressive facial features and, and um, the way that, that faces are carved is not so stoic and standardized. It's sort of individualized, but more it's, it's mostly just playing on this, um, this idea of high emotion. Uh, this giant is kind of writhing in pain. He looks like he's kind of agonized where she's pulling his hair back. 
We also see depictions of death very kind of, um, the, the sort of throes of death being very dramatically depicted here. Um, okay, now this is one of the most famous sculptures in the Western world. Um, it is currently at the Louvre, and it's one of their main attractions at the Louvre in Paris. So um, if you go to the Louvre, if you were to spend 20 to 30 seconds in front of each individual piece of artwork in the Louvre, it would take you over three months to get through the entire collection. So it's huge. There's tons and tons and tons of art. And if you go and want like kind of the truncated hit the highlights sort of tour, at least this was, you know, like 20 years ago when I was last there, there's this um, uh, pamphlet that kind of shows the highlights. So thing one that, that's really famous that people like to see is the Mona Lisa. And the other two, the other two of the like really big kind of like heavy hitters of the collection are this sculpture and another one we're going to look at in a moment. This is the Nike of Samothrace. So you may remember Nike from when we talked about the Acropolis. The Nike is a personification of Athena. Um, it's particularly the winged victory. And this particular depiction is the most famous depiction of the Nike. You can see she's lost her arms and her head. Um, but this is one of the, like I said, most famous sculptures in the Western world. Why do you think that might be? Take a minute to look at this and think about everything we've learned up to this point about Greek sculpture. Why might this be so famous? Okay, a couple of things. One, it's really grand. It's on, she's on the ship. She has this kind of grand view. Another thing is um, there's something kind of mysterious. She doesn't have, she's missing her head. There's some kind of air of mystery. If you look at this, knowing the Greek interest in anatomy and the body, you can see how she is being portrayed in a way that is, she's clothed, but you can still see the body underneath, which is kind of provocative. So she's on the prow of a ship. So there's, you know, seawater coming up and wind blowing her clothing, which is damp against her. So you can see the contours of her body beneath. Uh, the fabric, which is very clinging. You could actually even like see her belly button through it. Um, the way the, the fabric is depicted is having all this movement, being very dynamic. Her wings kind of up behind her. It's a very dramatic, very dynamic kind of sculpture that um, really ca has captured the attention and the imagination of viewers for, you know, thousands, a th several thousand years. So it's, it's a very famous work. Um, it's about eight feet one inch high, and it's in the stair, one of the stairwells of the Louvre. So you come up these stairs and around a corner and see it kind of up above you. And it's, it's, it's pretty magical. It's, it's a neat thing to see. Okay. Also at the Louvre and one of, um, the, the other kind of heavy hitters on the tour, along with the Mona Lisa, which we'll talk about if you take our history too, and, uh, the Nike of Samothrace is the Venus de Milo. So this is misnamed because Venus is the Roman word for her, <laughs> okay? So this is actually um, the Aphrodite of Milos, which is where it was found. Um, but she's known as the Venus de Milo. She was carved by Alexandros of Antioch on the Meander. And uh, she's also very famous. Um, she's lost her arms over the years. You can see that this is, again, in keeping with these new ideas about proportions and kind of looking at the human body and looking at the individual way that uh, human bodies um, can be portrayed. Uh, it's fairly sensuous in terms of the marvel. This uh, was someone who was uh, kind of obviously a fan of Praxitalis. If you think back to his Aphrodite of Nidos, we have some similarities there. Um, though there are some differentiations in style. Also look at the treatment of the drapery, very well carved. Uh, so this is the Venus de Milo, very famous sculpture. Um, this, we have the, uh, this is Aphrodite, Eros and Pan, and it's from Delos, Greece. Um, and here we have a pretty direct visual reference to the Aphrodite of Nidos by Praxitalis. Um, and this is kind of a little bit funny. So this is something that we see coming into sculpture and art forms in the Hellenistic period is this idea about humor um, and using humor to humanize the gods. So Pan is grabbing Aphrodite, Cupid is then grabbing Pan by the horn, 
um, or Eros rather, sorry, Giva is his Roman name. And then if you can see what's in Aphrodite's hand, she's taken off her sandal and she's about to smack Pan in the face with her sandal. So it's kind of like, get off me, leave me alone, but everybody's smiling. So it seems like it's kind of playful. So there's this idea of uh, laughing and this playfulness, this kind of um, a little bit of a absurdity and just kind of humanizing the gods further. So this is a thing that we see throughout Greek culture, but it becomes quite popular, especially in the Hellenistic period. I don't know if you can hear that or not. There's some kind of weird mechanical noise where I am. I apologize. Um, so we have this combination of uh, erotic interest because we have a nude figure and she's the goddess of love, right? And this humorous kind of parody. Um, and, and this is pretty common in the Hellenistic period. We see this a lot. Another thing that we see is an interest in verism, which um, becomes very important, we'll see, in the Roman Empire. Verism meaning um, truth and form. So uh, not just showing people who are timeless and young and idealized, but also showing things like this old woman and this old drunk guy. Um, and this interest in realism beyond the ideal that we see um, is the preferred thing in the earlier classical period. So in the Hellenistic period, this interest in being able to depict things more realistically extends outside the realm of what is ideal. And people are interested in depicting like wrinkles on old people and um, this sort of drunken, disheveled kind of look. So we see more interest um, beyond just ideal specimens of uh, young human form, basically, become an interest in the Hellenistic period. Um, lastly, I want to talk about this particular sculpture. This is the Lacoon. This is also a very, very famous sculpture. Um, so at the beginning of the se second century AD, the Roman general uh, Flaminius defeats the Macedonian army and declared Greece free. Okay. Um, then Greece becomes a Roman province in 146 CE. So it's free briefly from this Macedonian kind of like massive empire that takes over and then it immediately becomes part of Rome. Um, this, the interest in Greek sculpture to create both copies of these classical sculptures and also um, Hellenistic work and also just new work based on, on Greek work is called ala Grec. Uh, this is another phrase that you'll see in Canvas in your vocabulary. And this becomes very popular in Rome once Greek becomes kind of a province of Rome. Um, one such work is this one. This is the Lacoon. And so this is, um, you can see this, it's in the Vatican Museum in, in uh, Italy. Uh, and what's happening here is a Trojan priest who is named Lacoon um, is being attacked by snakes. Um, Pliny the Elder attributes this to three different sculptors, Athenodoros, Hagisandros, and Polydoros of Rhodes. So three master sculptors worked on this together. Um, it's unearthed in 1506 um, in the presence of Michelangelo, very famous of the Renaissance Michelangelo, sculptor and painter, and he's very heavily influenced by this. So this is an aspect of Hellenistic work that is very much influenced by Lysippus and this interest in showing um, kind of more elaborate musculature. So um, really larger defined muscles and also all these little veins and ligaments and things that step out and this kind of writhing, these bodies that are in these heroic, like really dynamic poses. This is something that is of a lot of interest to Michelangelo. Um, and it's also something that we see in Hellenistic sculptures from this time. Um, this is found in the ruins of the palace of Emperor Titus. Uh, Lacun is described in Virgil's Aeneid, so this is a writing by Virgil. Um, and basically the gods wanted the Greeks to win the Trojan War, okay? Um, and uh, so this guy, Lacun, is a Trojan priest and he tries to warn the Trojans not to accept the, the horse, the wooden horse that has all the soldiers in it. He's like, this is a bad idea, we shouldn't accept this. Because he tried to warn them against the Greeks and the gods favored the Greeks, they punish him. The gods punish Lacun. So they send sea serpents to um, eat him, basically, uh, to, to punish him and, and to attack him and his sons, which is what's being depicted here. Uh, so it's 
in Virgil's account um, of this, Lacoon and his sons suffer horribly and are defeated by the sea serpents. So that is the story that's being depicted here. You can again see this Hellenistic interest in heavy emotionalism. It's kind of reminiscent of uh, the altar of Zeus that we are looking at and the giant having its hair pulled back by Athena and all the like emotion, the raw emotion and drama in the face. We can see that in, in these faces as well. Also just the mastery of this. So there's two snakes, two sea serpents in here and they've one hand is a couple of the hands uh, have broken off and part of the snake is broken off but look at this was all carved out of one solid block of marble so think about these three figures and these two uh, big muscly like snakes intertwining all around all carved out of a solid block of marble so you can see this um, showcasing this incredible talent uh, for depicting the natural world and depicting human anatomy uh, along with this intense emo emotionalism okay so that is ancient Greece and next we will talk about the Etruscans and Rome.